Scott Metcalf is the Vice President of Pavement Preservation Specialty Products at Aragon Asphalt and Emulsions. He has previously worked with SEM materials and Coke materials, totally more than 25 years experience. I'm going to try building off of the last two presentations and uh, talk about slurry seal equipment needed to do a slurry and microsurfacing. When Judith asked me to do this presentation, I said, fantastic, I got this. And uh, I already have a pre canned presentation of 195 slides and about a day of training. And she said, you got 10 minutes to do it. So I tried to pick uh, 15 slides that really represent the key attributes of what you're gonna need to do to have a successful slurry or micro job. So without further ado, we'll try to move through this. Tree trimmings, first thing you need to make sure you have. Uh, your trees need to be trimmed up. If a fire truck can't go through there and it's 14 feet high, uh, typically that's what you like to have that canopy raised to. Uh, UPS, FedEx, and the rest of the crew will love you for it, but your slurry micro crew will really appreciate it because if you can imagine this truck going down a tree canopy lane and having leaves fall into it and trying to coat and seal coat uh, leaves that have been falling on the ground, probably not the thing you want to do. So let's make sure we do our tree trimming. We want to follow some good patch practices. Slurry and micro are not good candidates when we look at this. This type of cracking needs to be dug out and removed, uh, fully patched, and good patch paving practices need to occur. Once we do that, got good crack, good surface to put it on, we're gonna have a very successful project. Crack sealing practices, as Brian talked about earlier, making sure you route, blow dry, uh, get the moisture out, uh, herbicide, get the, uh, the growth out. If you look at this, here's a, a project that's ongoing. They've just put this lane down in, in a slurry or micro, and here's this crack that has vegetation growing in it, not been routed, not been filled, and the expectation with that crack should come back through, spall off, and we should have vegetation growing back relatively soon is the emulsifier packages make a great fertilizer uh, for this. So routing, cleaning, herbicide, and getting the cracks filled, as you see over here, a nice filled crack that has been squeegeed flush. So the, the crack sealant is slightly below the surface. We don't have a lot of overbanding. It's gonna come through the slurry. You're not gonna see that crack coming through the slurry or micro. We wanna protect and mark all of our utility covers prior to a slurry seal in our microsurfacing system. Here's in one contractor, he uses a, a tar paper with duct tape and uh, he tabbed each one of these. So if you can see, there's a tab on there. Uh, so he knows how to relocate those uh, and easily remove and peel off the surface. On the other side we have here is we have uh, some uh, tar paper it's really a best friend's uh, application. He's gonna take this squeegee, this excess material onto this tar paper and have a nice uniform joint protecting the concrete. We have a summary of good pre-surfacing practices. You need to have those trees trimmed. Pavement needs to be patched and, and fully patched. Vegetation needs to be removed from the cracks uh, in the roadway system. Uh, crack sealants need to be uh, applied, um, usually within three to four weeks ahead of time. Uh, we have seen them earlier, but uh, we'd like to see that about a month before uh, we actually get the seal coat there. Let those get set and cured and, and have, make sure you have good adhesion of that crack sealant. Thermoplastic needs to be removed, ground off, uh, roadway swept, striping and, and tabs put in place so we know what our next striping methodology is going to be for this roadway if we're going to change it. Uh, utilities are covered and we have a traffic control plan. Here we see a vacuum sweeper. A vacuum sweeper is kind of the preferred. We want to get those fines sucked out of that matrix. And usually a kick broom won't do as good a job as getting those fines sucked out of the matrix as a vacuum uh, broom will, but it's a good process. Make sure we've got a clean road. Here's an example of being proactive in cleanliness. If you can see over here, you have the slurry truck on the right-hand side. It was getting ready to go. It's also a trash truck day. So this operator of the traffic control truck here sees the trash truck is hitting these trees and throwing trash up, he gets out of the truck, gets his blower out, and making sure he blows all that debris off. That's that proactive that everyone needs to know a clean surface is, the, is a good surface to apply on. This is a, a great photograph of just being, here's a driver, understands what quality control is, he's been educated the process, he knows what the right surface needs to be, gets out and takes care of it before we go to the slurry. No agency wants to find out that, well, 
that happened because of the street wasn't properly cleaned when it could have been cleaned and should fully be expected to be cleaned. Why that's all going on uh, on the street and you got the cleaning and, and the striping and removals and crack sealing, stockpile needs to be built. And in the stockpile location, you should see historically a screening plant. Now, if you're, uh, I guess, say east of New Mexico, uh, you usually see a screening plant in most of your slurry or micro projects. When you're out west in the drier climates where we don't have as much uh, consolidation and we have a little bit drier stockpiles, we don't see the use of screening plants as much. So we have the screening plant on the right-hand side there, screening away, making sure there's no clumps, that everything meets the gradation that's intended in the specification. You're gonna have an aggregate stockpile there. Once your aggregate has been delivered, you wanna make sure it's on a nice pad that you don't have contamination. So you wanna build that pad up so you have about 5% uh, excess material left in the pad, but you're never having a loader deep, deep dig down into the pad and possibly bring up some native materials that would be oversized. You have your asphalt emulsion. Here you have brake control additives, type one and type two cement, water, loading, mineral. Material sampling. This is a great time to get your material samples uh, at the stockpile location. If you're gonna do that, here's the real key thing. This is something I learned from Utah 25 years ago, meeting with the director's office. You don't get what you spec, you get what you inspect. Too many times we, we hear problems, we ask them about the materials that were used, did they meet spec, and no one can tell us that. They have a certification that met it, but they never did any quality control testing. Here's a great time to get those quality control tests taken care of. Slurry and micro come in type one, type two, and type three. Type one is traditionally used on cul-de-sacs, low speed roadways, and airport runways. Type two and three utilized Type two, residential streets. Type three, your highways. Your equipment needs to be calibrated. Scott gave an excellent presentation on the advancements of calibration. We're gonna calibrate our aggregate, our emulsion, mineral fillers, brake control, and water. You're gonna need a scale for this. You're gonna need a location to go do this. With the newer equipment, you can calibrate as quick as 30 minutes. With some of the older equipment where you had to do belts and whistles in some multiple calibrations, uh, it could take you a whole day. But you're gonna need a scale multiple scales and capability of, of weighing this out. At the back end of all slurry and microsurfacing equipment, you have aggregate, your aggregate great, gates, mineral filler, water, brake control, and emulsion. They all pretty much look similar in the back end. It's a mixing component. You're gonna take the aggregate, you take your emulsion, you're gonna take your water, you're gonna mix it into a pug mill. If you look there, the pug mill's right here. All those additives are gonna go in there. They're gonna get thoroughly mixed together, come out in a chute and be put in this box. We're gonna talk about this spreader box here in a little bit, but the back end of most pavers are, are slurry micro machines. We have the same thing. We have aggregate, we have mineral filler, we have emulsion water getting mixed, put into the back of the box, or in this process, continuous machine, and we'll get to that next. Here's your different configurations. You have truck mounted units, can be trash, old trash trucks that convert it into units, uh, get some Peter belts or you can have a continuous unit. The benefit of a continuous unit versus the truck mounted units is the truck mounted unit has so much aggregate on board and water and liquid, and eventually it runs out and has to stop and you have to leave a joint. Where a continuous unit can have multiple trucks out in front of it and continually go down the street. So if you had four support vehicles or five support vehicles, you might not outrun your coverage and this machine would continuously run without giving a joint. Where with the truck mounted units, you are gonna have some joints. But different environments, residential, really windy mountain roads, those truck units work very well. It's kind of a liking, you see a lot more truck units out in the Western US and a lot more continuous units in the uh, Midwest and the East Coast. There's slurry boxes, kind of an argument going out in the West, is a slurry box augered or not augered? We're seeing multiple contractors move to an augered slurry box. And if you can see here, the material in this, box looks much more uniform in distribution, or actually not uniform in distribution. You see a pile here of aggregate and it's very liquidy. Where here you see it nice and uniform, fully dispersed aggregate, looking good. This is what it should look like just going down the roadway. Here we have a truck mounted unit spraying a little bit of water to cut the dust on the surface. Machine going down the roadway, augered box. 
filling in just the surface on the side there and easy to go. Some people may be doing rut filling and you hear microsurfacing slurry that micro is a, a chemical breaking system versus slurry is an evaporative breaking uh, product. And if you're using a microsurfacing where you can stack stones, uh, rut filling is one of the great advantages of the product was developed for in Germany back in the 80s. And here you show see a picture of where you had some consolidations. They used a rut filling box, a micro box. So you did rut filling first on the lanes, on the wheel paths, filled those ruts, then came back over the top with a full width microsurfacing using an augered box. And an augered box is critical when you're using microsurfacing. Some people use a rubber tire roller at the end of rolling a, a project if they want to release the traffic. If I was doing an airfield that didn't have ro rolling traffic on it, I use a rubber tire roller. This is a project in Irvine, California. Once you get you're done with your rubber tire roller, you pick up your traffic control, you're going to take that broom and go sweep it again. Post sweeping is what they call it. We're going to get our striping on it. And then here's a road that is uh, seven years old that uh, is performing. Uh, no delaminations. It's a clean road, it's striped well performing very good, and we should see, you know, seven to 10 years of life uh, in the right environments. So that's all I have, and thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.